these innovations in tools and schools make the opportunity for people to learn worldwide better uh, every single month. I'm Catherine Mangy Ward, and I'm here with Reason TV today. We're speaking with Tom Vanderark, who's the CEO of Getting Smart, and uh, one of the people you want to talk to about the future of online education. Tom, thank you for being with us. Good to be with you. Tell me about this future of education. Where are we headed? What's next? Well, we've seen this explosion in mobile technology, so learning is becoming mobile. It's also becoming modular. But for most kids, it's still going to be, it's still going to happen um, at a school down the street. And so we're starting to see really interesting combinations of online learning and face-to-face -face learning. People call that blended learning. So learning is becoming blended, it's becoming personalized, and increasingly competency-based, which means kids show what they know and they progress based on mastery. One of your projects has been um, to kind of incubate, encourage, and fund uh, early uh, education ventures. Can you talk about, I think for some people, um, you know, that seems like there might almost be a tension there, like you're trying to make money on education. Uh, explain why that's the wrong way to think about it. So I left philanthropy about eight years ago a little bit discouraged about the 400 nonprofits that I had worked with. None had really achieved the, uh, their full ambitions. And the sector uh, had almost no R&D. There was just very little investment in innovation. And compared to other sectors like healthcare, which is also a public delivery system, uh, where there's a dramatic amount of uh, research and development and a really important contributions by the private sector that hasn't been true in learning. Uh, so what, what's happened in the last five years is that uh, billions of dollars have been invested in startups that are building new tools and it's really these new tools that are powering new schools new learning environments that have the the potential to work much better for students and teachers uh, get specific for me what's something that you've had a hand in directly indirectly it doesn't matter um, so uh, uh, one startup is edmodo it's a social learning platform it's used by about 45 million uh, teachers and students worldwide, makes it really easy for teachers to make and manage assignments. Another one is Coursera. It's used by 10, mil uh, 10 million people worldwide. It has free access to the best professors in the world. Class Dojo, uh, behavior management system used by 35 million uh, teachers and students. All these resources are av available for free uh, to teachers, um, and that's why they've really gone viral worldwide. So now you're kind of on the tech side. Uh, you started your career as a superintendent. Uh, can you talk about, I, I find when I'm sort of talking to people who have developed a super great new tool or an app or something, and they're like, the tech is perfect. All we have to do now is get it integrated into the schools. This should be no problem. And it's always like, oh God, you have no idea how hard this is gonna be. Um, you know, as someone who's kind of been on the, on both sides, you right. know, what, what is it that people are missing? Why isn't there greater, faster uptake of some of these good tools? Well, one, you know, one exciting um, thing I can report is that it is happening. Um, these free and viral tools are being adopted by teachers worldwide. So there's kind of a new back door to the classroom. Teachers are, and parents and kids are finding these tools and, and putting them to good use. So, you know, a, a, more than a third of America's classroom have these new tools. Teachers are finding them. Kids are bringing their phones to school. Really cool things are happening from the bottom up. And then we're also seeing superintendents and school networks being really thoughtful about investing in technology, so improving student access to technology and, and helping to create new blended learning environments. So some thought leadership and a lot of teacher leadership and, and then parents um, helping to hack their own kids education so it's coming from the bottom from the the in from outside in and and in some places from the top down so this is happening faster than most people think yeah i don't listen to your answer i almost want to believe you i almost i almost want to be <laughs> optimistic about it but i mean isn't the status quo still basically that the vast majority of kids are told you know they can't even have their phone at school most that schools changed that changed last year it Last year was the first year where the majority of school districts dropped their ban on cell phones and at least uh, left it up to teachers on, on whether and how to use the technology. So it's happening really fast. And you know what happened in 2010, tablets came in. We've seen in, since 2010, the, the, the price of devices has plummeted. Uh, broadband has become more ubiquitous. 
Um, most parents have a, a smartphone, so most parents, even low-income families, are connected to the internet. So. The digital conversion is happening fast. You also have been involved with the X Prize folks. Uh, talk about just kind of in a general way why do prizes work, and then more specifically, yeah. how can they help education? So, so today I, I uh, at the conference I spoke about why prizes and pull mechanisms are are so attractive. The main reason is you can't really um, mandate innovation, and we need innovation in learning the, because the opportunity set is so great. So what, what states can do is use prizes and other sort of demand aggregation strategies, uh, incentives uh, to encourage innovation so they can give new school grants, they can create innovation zone where, where innovation can happen. Uh, they can put our RFPs for new capabilities that don't exist. They can run prizes for new, uh, new data systems and, and those kind of strategies invite the world to work on your problem. And, and that often works much better than trying to mandate a solution. Do you ever get sick to death of the word innovation? No. Every day, you just love saying that word? I love it, and I, I, I'm convinced that learning is the most important thing for individuals, for families, for communities, for countries, and the, the really exciting thing is that these innovations in tools and schools make the opportunity for people to learn worldwide better uh, every single month. And, right around the corner is the chance to, every, to educate every young person on the planet. We're really close to being able to create um, low cost blended environments so that the 500 million young people today that don't have access to really good secondary uh, will be able to have it. And, and that's, that's uh, five, not more than 10 years away. And that, that means where politics allow, there'll be no excuse for for not giving every kid on the planet the chance to plug into the idea economy. I think that's a big a big deal. Last question, this morning we heard from Jeb Bush, who uh, may or may not be running for president. Would you vote for, would you vote for Jeb Bush? And if you did, what would you want to see him do? So Jeb uh, was, I think, the best education governor that we've had uh, in, the, in the last 20 years. I've had the chance to work with Governor Bush and his team for the last four years. Um, he has gotten even better on education issues. He has um, uh, an informed and intuitive sense about the opportunity set that I'm excited about. And uh, for that reason, it's been great to work with him and his team. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking a minute to talk with us today. For Reason TV, I'm Catherine Mangi-Ward, speaking with Tom Vanderark, CEO of Getting Smart.